Good morning, Thrive Online. Grab your coffee, grab your family, and get ready to worship.
name on heaven or on earth that compares to your name, the name that your Father gave to you so all of us could call on your name and recognize you and walk with you. God, thank you. Thank you for that name that we can call on. It says in your word that you are in front of us. You are beside us. And you are behind us in all that we do. In all that we do. And that name is a rescuer. That name is a comforter. That name is above all names, and we give you worship this morning. Amen. Good morning. Welcome, Thrive Church. My name is Megan, and I am here to let you know what is going on. First and foremost, we have our Connect card. We want to connect with you, and the way that we do this is by you clicking on the virtual link that your online host is going to put for you, and you can let us know a little bit more about yourself and ways to get connected at Thrive, especially if you are new to Thrive or you haven't clicked on it and checked it out. We want you to click on that right now. Another amazing opportunity that we have to connect is in the building Next week on May 23rd, after service, we're going to be having our 15-minute party. This is an opportunity for you to meet pastors Andy and Sally and get to know a little bit more about Thrive. The past couple weeks, we have been talking about our Thrive Van project. We have been kicking this off with a great start. This is a tool that is going to help our ministry in... Um, let me start that again. All right. This is a ministry tool that is gonna help us get more students to thrive and help them to find Jesus. When you give to this project, make sure that you click on the menu and select van. And now we're gonna take up our online offering. We continue to see God use our church to have an impact. From feeding the homeless Thursday with the Opportunity House to the Thrive Ministries and the work that they do, and this is all because of you that we can see God moving. Would you give now to see our mission grow to help it make it easy for people to find and follow Jesus? Your online host is going to post a link for you to be able to make your offering right now. And now we continue with our series today, Rooted, Grow Deep, Live Strong. Let's get to it. Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. What is up, Thrive? Welcome once again to Thrive Online. We're so glad that you have joined us. Uh, Sally and I, as the lead pastors of Thrive, love that you jump in and are a part of seeing what God wants to do into your life. In fact, uh, we've had a passion over the last six years that we have launched Thrive Church that we want to make it easy, uh, as easy as possible for people to be able to find Jesus and to follow him. And we've seen God do some incredible things through our church, and we cannot wait wait to see what God is going to do, because there are some great things that God has in store for Thrive Church coming up. You know, and last week we kicked off a brand new series called Rooted, Grow Deep and Live Strong. And the series is all around the idea of, in the Bible, trees are everywhere, from the beginning, the middle, to the end. 
And while we see what is above the ground, it really is the roots that make all the difference to a healthy and vibrant and flourishing tree. And the tree really is a symbol of life for God. And he wants it to be a parallel to our own lives. Well, what we see oftentimes is just the outward appearance of things. What really matters is our roots, the things that we draw into our souls and into our lives that matter. And when our roots are deep, especially deep in Jesus, that's when we are strong in our lives. That is when we can attack anything that comes our way because God is with us and he is all around us. And last week, the kind of the first tree and the first way to look at roots was we talked about when you're discouraged, what does it look like to develop some deep roots? Because if you have deep roots, you can defeat the discouragement which comes in your life. And all of us get discouraged at some point and to be able to have that encouragement because we know what to do because our roots are in Jesus. It was a powerful week. I would encourage you actually, if you haven't seen it, jump onto our YouTube page. Maybe when you're there, hit the subscribe button so you follow in all of the content whenever we release it, but you can catch up in the series and find out just how we kicked off last Sunday in discouragement, because today we're moving on to the next tree, and we're actually going back to the very beginning of the story, the very beginning of all of our stories in a tree that was sacred to God. The tree was actually in the garden. We're talking about the original garden, his garden. And this tree was at the center, the very middle of the garden of God. And God actually gave some very strict instructions regarding this tree. He's like, hey, don't eat the fruit. Any other tree in the garden, you want to eat that fruit, free game. But this tree had this sacred, holy quality to it. It deeply mattered to God. And so the instructions were given to Adam and Eve, the very first, the original humans on the planet, don't eat from this tree. I don't know about you, but sometimes when humanity is told, don't do something, uh, we can't help ourselves. You hear those words, you know, don't do this, you can't do that, and that switch flips in some of the people that are watching, and you just can't help but get out there and try to go for it and, and to do the thing that you're told not to do. I think that's just kind of built into us a little bit because of what we're going to learn today. See, the choice that they ended up making changed everything. Changed everything for them, but actually it changed everything for you and I and for the entire world. See, the choice they made wasn't a good choice. And we're going to see how profoundly when they made this choice that it royally was a mess up of epic proportions. It's interesting, when I heard this story growing up that we're going to look at today, I used to think, they ate this fruit, things got really bad. I used to think, how could they do this? Like, why would they make this choice? You know, like, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. And you know what? Actually, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit because I don't like it. You know what? But if God would have said, don't eat the steak, I'd be like, sorry, world, I'm done. But in reality, the more that I had to grow up in my understanding, the more that my roots got connected to who God was in my life, the more I discovered that, you know what? Every single one of us is prone to royally mess things up, to really go against God and the design and the plan that he has for us in our lives, and that when we make these royal mistakes and these mess-ups, that there are consequences, and it's hard sometimes, and we try to figure out how to navigate through this in our lives, and we don't do well, all because, in truth, our roots are really shallow. Our roots are really about ourselves. They're not really deep in God, and that's why we oftentimes struggle in this life. See, I'm guessing... That you, when you think about your life, have your own royal mess-ups, just like Adam and Eve. Moments where you had such a big mistake that you would do anything to be able to go back to that moment in time, to that situation, to that circumstance, and you would love to do it over. A mistake that you made in a relationship. A mistake that you made financially. A mistake that you made in your selfishness, in your impulsiveness, maybe in your youth, and you're still feeling and dealing with those mistakes today. See, we've all made mistakes that we honestly wish we could go back and do over. And I'm talking about the sinful kind, the broken kind, the ones that we feel guilt and shame over, the ones that sometimes they're really big mistakes and sometimes they're a series of small ones over time that end up becoming big. I'm talking about pride and 
and the lies, and lust and envy and greed and, and jealousy and laziness. I'm talking about those kinds of mistakes, those kinds of mess up and sinful choices, right? Uh, we don't like to talk about those very much. We like to forget them. We like to try to put as much distance from those things as we possibly can because we just don't want to make the same mistakes again. But somehow, some way, we all, we all end up messing up again and again, it's just like we can't help it. And if it's not enough, then we compound the mess ups when they happen. Even after the initial mistake, we try to conceal and hide. And as we're going to see, they often get found out. And it just adds to our struggles. I imagine some of you are out there right now kind of playing through the ones in your minds. And as I was going through the message today, I was going through mine. Because the truth is, when we try to hide things, even if the world doesn't know what might have gone on or the choice that we made, God does. And you do. And if you let it, you let those mistakes and those mess ups in your life, they can become so impacting that we become defined by our mess. We see ourselves through the mess as we live our lives. The consequences of the mess, sometimes we hold on to and we feel like we have to carry with us and deal with in our lives going forward. And they can hold you captive. They can keep you a hostage. When you have that sinful mistake that you hold on to, it'll hold you back from where you want to go all because You've got very shallow roots. You're not really drawing on God. You're trying to just draw off of yourself and that never leads you to a good place. See, it's why from day one of creating this world, God knew our capacity to mess up, big and small. And he had a plan all along to help us through them, to not be defined by them, to be dependent on him, to develop the deep roots that we have in our lives so that we can grow beyond our mess ups and get beyond our mistakes. And I'm here to tell you today that you can get beyond whatever mistake, choice, problem, situation that you found yourself being put into. God is wanting us to get some roots today in our lives. And that's why deep roots matter. Because it's in moments like these that we need to be able to live strong, to overcome the sins of the past, but also to withstand the things that we have that are in front of us that we don't fall into. So God wants to give us the ability to stand on him. Because this is one thing that we all know. We're going to mess up again. And I'm thankful that there is a God and his name is Jesus who came to make sure that we could be set free from the mess. And I can't wait for us to look at this tree today and discover just how we can develop these roots so that when we mess up, we are ready to live strong, grow deep, and see what God wants to do in us. So let's jump in today, Thrive, and get ready to look at this tree and the story that God has for us today. So Thrive, let us open our Bibles yeah, well, let's celebrate as we are. We're going to be in the book of Genesis today. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. Very first book of the Bible. And this is what it says. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit, it looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit, ate it and then gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. See, the story is centered around a tree that's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's this moment of time when we see the very first sin 
enter into the world. Up until this point in chapter three, everything is good. God creates the world. God creates man. Man is alone, but God goes, that's not a good thing. So he creates woman, and it's like, hallelujah. And in that moment, all of a sudden, they're together, and that's when the snake shows up. Up until this point, it's beautiful. It's perfect. There is no sin in the world. It's the way God intended for this world to be. Chapter three hits, and the serpent shows up. And he strikes up a conversation with Eve because God had given them one instruction. Hey, all the trees, eat from it. The tree in the middle, don't eat the fruit from that tree. But the serpent comes. He's like, hey, girl, uh, did I hear somewhere that God said you couldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden? So the serpent shows up and he immediately is telling a lie because that's not what God had said. He's like, you can't eat from any of these. So he's already scheming. He's already off. And the enemy, God, wants to do it every single time he speaks into our lives. He wants to start off with a lie to twist up what we think. And she corrects him, but then adds a little element to it that wasn't in the original instructions. We can eat anything except for the tree in the middle. That one can't even touch it or we will die. God goes, don't, don't touch it. He's like, just don't eat it. The serpent goes, and he's undeterred in this moment. He's like, hey, you're not going to die. Actually, God knows your eyes will be open. You'll see things you never saw before, and you'll actually be like God. You'll know everything that he knows. And in that moment, Eve is tempted. Man, that's where always sin begins, isn't it? It isn't at the act of the moment. It actually pre comes before it, and there's this kind of premeditated moment that happens where we are drawn into temptation. See, temptation sets a trap that always leads to sin when we act on it. See, that's the thing. That's why God tells us in other parts of the Bible, like, don't fall into temptation. And that's what the serpent's doing right here. And that's what we fall into in our lives. All of a sudden, our minds start thinking about things that we wish we had or we wanted or that we think, and then we're lured in. So the serpent sets the stage. For Adam and Eve to just kind of fall into making a choice that is against everything God said, that's always what temptation does. It promises something real, but it actually is false. It is fake, and it's never good. For Adam and Eve, you know what? It came in two main places that we're going to see. It came in two main ways and forms. It came, temptation came in the form of instant pleasure and false maturity, Instant pleasure, you read in the story that Eve, when she started to buy into the temptation, she's like, hey, that tree is beautiful, that fruit is beautiful, it looks delicious. So she wanted the instant pleasure of eating that. And then they also fell into that reality of going, hey, you know what, I want to be like God. I want to think about it. We're still falling into those same two core temptations all throughout our lives. So that instant pleasure, the serpent might as well have said, hey, this won't hurt you. Who's going to know? If you like it, go for it. If it feels good, then it is good. People fall for that one, don't they, all the time. Go ahead, spend it, sleep with them, eat that, say that, drink that, smoke this, do that. All those things are temptations that start to get off in our head because we want them instant pleasure in a moment because we think there's something good that's there that's better than what God has for us. Eve fell for it. Eve also fell for the fact that you can be like God. And we act like this all the time in our own lives. You can say what you want, think what you want. You can act however you want. You can determine who you want to be, how you want to be seen. It's not bad for you. You can determine what's good for you and what's not for you. You can actually act like God. That's what the temptation of the servant promised. See, and in that moment, Eve sees the fruit. She has to have it. She's like, I want the wisdom from that. I want the deliciousness from that. So she eats it and she convinces Adam, her husband, to take a bite. And in that moment, the Bible says their eyes are opened. They're seeing things that they weren't meant to see. They're seeing things that are totally different than they had seen up until this point. And they instinctively knew that what they were seeing wasn't good. There was a feeling that they'd never felt before. Guilt shows up. Shame so shows up. And you know what they do? They look at themselves and go, wait a minute, we're naked and we shouldn't be. There's something when they looked at each other and went, wait a minute, we need to cover up right now. So they grab some fig leaves, again, off of another tree with the biggest leaves in that area and they sew them together to try to cover themselves up. This is the story where sin enters the world for the very first time. Three chapters up until then. Two chapters, it's great. Chapter three, sin just brings hell literally to earth. 
This is the first big royal epic mess up of all time. And the relationship from this moment with God is changed and it's fractured. The world, it's broken. Literally, the world does not operate and look and be like it has ever been before. Everything is done because of this choice, because of Eve, because of Adam. And the impact of this choice, this kind of false exchange between what the serpent says will happen and what they actually experienced puts Adam and Eve in the place of being enslaved to sin. See, enslaved because they gave up their souls, they gave up perfection for something way lesser. In their attempt to become like God, they're like, hey, we'll give up what God has for what the serpent is promising, and that temptation fell through and it never delivered. And here's the thing, when sin enters the world and you and I would make that same choice, everyone in the world becomes infected by sin. Every single one of us is prone to this in our lives, and we become enslaved ourselves And if we're honest, I think many of us would know the truth of what this means. We're enslaved by our love of money. We're enslaved by our love of sex. We're enslaved by our love of thrills. We're enslaved by our love of power, by by our pride, by our desire to be like God, by our desire to truly be in charge in our world. And immediately after this epic sinful choice and mess up, when it says their eyes were opened, they were naked, and all of a sudden they were completely filled with shame, something they'd never experienced before. All of a sudden, they're guilty over the choice that they made, and isn't that what sin does to us? We make a choice where we mess up, and that feeling just kind of overwhelms us, and then shame shows up shortly thereafter. They knew they were wrong. They knew the choices they were made were against what God had said, and that's always what guilt is directed toward. They felt guilty because of what they had done to God, and then their eyes look inward, and they start to feel the shame. Shame is always an inward thing inside of us that makes us realize that, you know what, maybe I'm the mistake. Maybe I'm the one that's a mess. Maybe I'm the one that's no good. And those feelings come over us, and sometimes we can hold on to those things, and they begin to define us as we think through the choices that we've made in our lives, the choices for the things that we've done, the places we've gone, the things that we've seen, the things that we wish we didn't do, and that guilt and that shame just becomes part of our story, and we hold on to it, and it gets heavier and heavier. Our roots are shallow, and we don't know what to do with it at all. See, when guilt and shame come, our immediate inclination and response is to do what Adam and Eve did. They immediately were like, wait a minute, this is not the state that we should be in right now. we got to try to do something when that happens. Adam and Eve said, you know, we're going to try and cover it up. Isn't that what we always do when we try to get into sin? We try to cover up the sinful moments in our lives. We try to hide it. We try to keep it from anybody else seeing because if they see what happened, then maybe they'll see how shameful and broken and messed up we are. So they sew these fig leaves together to kind of cover it up. And in covering up, they also try to hide from God. Check out verse 9 of chapter 3. It says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. First game of hide and seek ever. But this wasn't the kind of game that was actually fun. This was one of them trying to hide. And can you imagine trying to hide from the God of the universe who knows everything that's going on, who understood what was happening in this moment, but he's still there. And what's what we do all the time when we cover up? We try to hide it. Uh, We try to start lying about it, make excuses. We distance ourselves as much as we can from that choice so that people don't see it in us, to keep it hidden, to keep things away. So you keep reading the Bible, they cover themselves up, they try to run from God, and you know what follows? Blame. See, blame always follows running and hiding, because if running and hiding doesn't work, you know what, I'm going to stuff it in the closet, and then I hope nobody ever sees this. I'm going to try to keep it behind closed doors, thinking that it won't spill out into my life, but guilt and shame can't help but make its way out into our lives. But if somebody comes in contact and finds out what happened, you know what we do? The blame game shows up really fast. Adam blames Eve because she gave him the fruit. Eve blames the serpent because he's the one who tempted her into doing it. So blame tries to excuse our sin, giving a reason for it. It's interesting, as I was going through this, I thought back to one of the very first times that I made an epic mess of a choice, and then compounded it by so many series of other things. It was silly because I was back and I was like eighth, ninth grade and was hanging out with some of the wrong kids and 
This one particular night, we were heading out to just go hang out, and I took my brother's bike, which was extremely nice, way better than mine, and I was trying to look cool, and I wanted to, you know, portray a certain thing, so I've got my brother's bike that I'm out there riding, because he didn't know I even took it, so mistake number one, right? Like, I didn't ask, I just took his bike and went riding, and when we were out there, we were doing some things we shouldn't do. We were doing some stuff on a major road and starting to cause some traffic issues. Yeah, I was making some choices that were not good. All of a sudden, the police come riding up, they're spinning off. We take off going, and I was hauling on my bike to try to get away from them, and I'm cutting through this parking lot, and then all of a sudden, there's a concrete bumper, parking bumper, you know, the things that stop you from driving in, it was behind some grass that I couldn't see, and I went crashing into it, and I go flying over the handlebars, and the bike goes flying as well, and all of a sudden, I find myself laying on the ground, and the only good part of the night was the police couldn't see me, so they kept going. But I get up and I'm like bruised and I've got, you know, a little bit of blood and, and I'm trying to get that cleaned up. And I go to get on my brother's bike to try to go get away from this place and go home. And I look at it and the entire front fork is bent in this odd position. And the, and the, the rim of the bike is bent. And, and there were so many things about the bike that were scratched and it was just an absolute mess. So I go home and the whole way there, all I'm thinking is how can I get out of this? I've already made a choice that I shouldn't be making. I'm acting in ways that I shouldn't be acting. I'm not feeling great about it, but all I can think of is how do I cover this up to try to give myself time to try to solve it so that nobody knows. Because I know that because of this and some of the other things that I've been doing leading up to it, there's epic consequences coming for my family if this gets found out. So I go home, put the bike in the garage, hide it in the back, try to cover it up, go in the house, don't say anything. Brother asks for the bike, make up a lie, trying to cover it up. Tell him it's at a friend's house. And then I had to walk home because it was dark or some excuse. But dad's like, you need to go get it. It needs to be here. Your brother needs it. I'm trying to figure out a way that I can get it fixed and get it back. It's not working. All of a sudden it comes to light. It comes out. I've lied. I've hidden. I've done things that I shouldn't be doing, out doing things I shouldn't be doing. And so all of a sudden, my sinful choices of just trying to be cool and be all those things and lie about it catch up to me. And the consequences were significant for my family. Now, it's an interesting story because that happens when I'm back in late middle school, high school. So you're like, hey, I was young. You know, oh, that's a cute story. But here's the thing. Unfortunately for me, that sort of started a a season in my life that went on for quite a long time where all of a sudden there was this run of like lying that would be in there to try to make sure that I would cover things up so I didn't get in trouble. And, you know, I would blame other people and that kind of can spill into your life of even to this day sometimes like I don't want to be blamed for things because I don't want to go back to those moments like that and shame and covering up. And all of a sudden that kind of dominated where I became a professional at making sure that that was part of my story. And I'm guessing that I'm not alone in this, that some of you have your own cover-ups that you've tried to go through, attempts to deal with your mess-ups and your mistakes and your sinful choices, things that you know weren't right, that know weren't good, that were difficult and painful. You didn't feel right about it, but you still chose to go ahead with it anyway and then tried to cover it up, maybe hiding some of the financial things, maybe some mistakes and choices you made in a relationship, some things you clicked on. Maybe you actually took some extreme measures with maybe something happening, out, coming out of a relationship. The way that you talk, the lies that you tell, there's so many different ways that this can cascade out into our lives and it impacts us. See, that's the thing with sin. It impacts our relationships. And it cannot impact the way that we approach life. It impacts what we think and what we see about God because Adam and Eve tried to hide from God and they thought they knew how God would respond. And I think a lot of us think we know how God would respond to us too. We think God looks down at us in our mess, in our sin, in our screw-ups, and we think that God sees us in that way. And that, you know what? I've done too much. I've made too many mistakes. And I've heard this so many times as God, the building would come crashing down if I walked in the door because of the, some of the stuff that I've done. You know what? I think I'm a little bit too far gone because of some of the things that are part of my story that I don't even think God can help overcome those in my life. There's so much guilt and shame that we have that we do all we can to try to cover up and to try to hide from God in our lives. I think part of that is we just want to go, I'm just not sure I want to deal with it. I'm not sure what God would do if it came in contact with it. See, that's the trouble that we don't realize. Sin, sin brings suffering and death. 
It, that's all it delivers on every single time in our lives. And yet God's response to it will blow your mind. It will blow your mind. When we come to a place where someone hurts or, or they do something that like betrays us or, or royally just hurts us in some way, we don't easily forget, do we? We want to get even. We want to get back to them. And we think God acts like we do, that he's not going to accept us, that what we've done is too far and too much. But the story that we're reading today, from the very beginning with the very first mess up, the response that God gives to Adam and Eve should give you some comfort today, should give you some encouragement today, should give you some hope today, wherever you're at and whatever mess you're thinking about or going through in your head, whatever major regret you go back to and go, gosh, that's a moment that I wish I could do over See, God's response to sin was different than what Adam and Eve or we could ever imagine. See, God shows you mercy even in your mess. Oh, I love those words, and I pray you just hold on to them today. Take a picture of it. Write them down. Put them on something that you can do. God shows you mercy even in your mess. So you go down to Genesis 3, verse 8. Again, when the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife were heard, the Lord God walking among the gardens. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Now, this is a where are you question, that not because God didn't know where they were, but God knew what he was kind of moving towards. Kind of like a dad or a mom at this point, kind of knowing what they're after before they go to, but they want to try to help you come to a different place in your life of explaining he replied, this is Adam, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied, that's why I ate it. Drop down to verse 20, it says, then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And then verse 21, and this verse right here tells us everything about the heart of who God is. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Now you might see that verse and you don't realize what's talking about there. But all through this passage, we see something that God has come to do and to show and to be in us. See, God, in response to sin... And the message that we make actually shows mercy. He shows mercy because if you look at this actually in your mess, we see it with Adam and Eve that God pursues you. God pursues you. In the story, he actually comes looking for Adam and Eve. Now, do you think for a moment that Adam and Eve or that God doesn't know what had taken place. No, this is his world that he created. He knew what was happening. And the moment they ate that fruit, God knew what was going on. I don't know about you, but there's some moments in my life with my mom and dad that they literally figured stuff out. I have no idea how. It's like mom's got eyes on the back of their head. It's like dad's got like, you know, this extra crazy ability to kind of see into the future of what's going to happen. It's like parents sometimes just have this crazy ability to know what's happening. And God knew exactly what took place. And guess what? He still shows up in the garden to reach out to Adam and Eve. Even in the mess, he wants to be with them. And he's here to pursue you. And he's here to pursue me. In spite of the sinful choice, God goes, you're worth it. I love you. I want to be connected with you. I want to pursue you because you are bigger and you are worth more than all the sin that is in your life. And that love that he had for us is what calls us to, and compels him to come and pursue us. But lest you think that God doesn't want to deal with this sin, no, God can't take that. And so you know what happens next. God calls out your sin. He pursues you because he loves you, but he will call you out for it. In this story, we lie and we make excuses. And it's exhausting, isn't it, to make excuses? I mean, all the things we try to do to just excuse the sin in our lives. I don't know about you, but I get tired of trying to go, it's not my fault, and she told me to, or he said. It ruins us when we get to this place of trying to just lie to ourselves, to blame other people. See, but God spoke, though, and said, hey, what did you do? Let's acknowledge it. 
Let's call it out. You ate from the tree. I said not to. There are consequences that come from that. If you actually continue reading on past verse 13 into 14 into 15 into 16, what you see is God going, hey, there are consequences for what happened. Know that I'm pursuing you, that I love you. But we have to deal with what goes on in this moment because sin is that powerful that if God goes, I can't just let it go, but it has to be dealt with. So sometimes the choices we make, there are consequences that we wish we could get out of. And sometimes we just have to step back and go, you know what? I need to be able to deal with those things, but only if I call it out. And some of you need to call out some sin in your life today because God sees it. He knows it already. He can see it inside of you. And he wants us to change it inside of ourselves by actually calling it out, confessing it. That's what it is. Maybe you need to go to somebody and you need to make something right. Maybe you need to share something that you've never shared. Maybe you need to come clean out loud to someone, even on a connect card here with Thrive and say, hey, this is something I'm dealing with. I've not shared it, but I want to get it out into the light of day because when you call it out, then you can begin to deal with it. And guess what? Then you can begin to be free from it. See, we see what God does next. And this beautiful thing that happens is actually a foreshadowing of the beauty of who Jesus is. See, God pursues you. God calls out your sin. And then God shows you mercy. Oh, man. That very last verse that we read, and the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and Eve. Remember, up until this point, they are covered with fig leaves. They've kind of tried to cover up sin as best as they can on their own, but it's not going to last. Those leaves aren't going to be anything that's going to be able to sustain them. So God goes, wait a minute, I'm going to step in and I'm actually going to clothe you. I'm going to care for you in the middle of this. I'm going to show you mercy. Even though you deserve something else, I'm going to be kind and I'm going to show compassion to you. But in giving them these animal skins, you know what had to happen? Those animals had to be sacrificed. Blood had to be spilled, which really is the beginning of when we sin against God and sin leads to death. You know what? God goes, hey, there needs to be a payment made for that in order to make things right again. And that's why when we read it from this moment forward in the Old Testament that there has to be the shedding of blood for the, 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 the debt to be paid. And so here, it's really kind of a foreshadowing of what was to come, this debt payment that we owed. God shed some blood and said, hey, I'm going to cover you temporarily to make sure that you can begin to move forward because that's how merciful and that's how good that I want to be and that's how I want to show you. And what we see here is this clearly was an anticipation of Jesus coming later on. See, anytime you read the Old Testament, we've got to read it through the lens of Jesus because that was ultimately God's plan. The perfect sacrifice that would come God himself on this planet, on this earth, to go, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to take all of your sin and all of your mess-ups onto me. Go to a cross so that you can be clean once and for all. And you can be connected back to God again so that you can make our way back to the garden to be connected to God in our life and then open up eternity. That's why the cross and the resurrection, he took our sins and he sacrificed himself and the man, the tomb, all of our sins were, were dead and buried and left there and Jesus came out and now eternity is back in our grasp if we just trust in who Jesus is. I love how God shows you and I mercy even in the midst of the things that we do that just fly in the face of how he longs for us to be. See, this is what we requires of us to learn more about who God is. We start deepening our roots and growing in God. Calling on our sin. We're developing deeper roots because we're trusting in what God says about who we are. When we go, God shows me mercy, then that just compels me to go, I have a, that's a God that's different than anything that I would do. That's a God that I want to trust in and believe in, and his name is Jesus. And some of you are listening and watching today, and you are going, you know what? I've got some epic mess-ups in my life that I would love to take all the baggage of shame and guilt and set it down, and there's only one way that you can do that. And that is to trust in and believe in the mercy of God through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, God himself dying for you. See, that's the power of what his blood can do. And if you don't believe this, I just want you to just take a moment as we get ready to wrap up today to just close your eyes and to just listen. 
There's a song that I want you to just kind of process through and think about in your own story, about what you've done and where you're at and what you think. In this moment, to be able to begin to just go, you know what, God, I want you to do something in and through me because I want to stand here today as this song says that I'm actually living proof of what God can do to change a life and a story. Let's pray now and just say, God, would you move in me to believe who you are and the mercy that you show us? of what God wants to do in you and in me today. That we have power to overcome all because of deep roots that grow down as we trust in him. And right now, I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray. And I want you to think about maybe some of the sinful choices that you've made. Maybe things that are recent things from your past. And I want you to begin to say, God, I need your mercy today. Let my roots be developed, God, and draw down deep into your mercy so that I can overcome and be set free today. God, in this moment, there are people that God feel like they're defined by their mess-ups, their mistakes. They desperately want to get past them, and there's only one way to do that, and that's only to be set free by the mercy and the grace and the power of Jesus Christ and his blood being shed on our behalf and canceling our debt 
And God, all it says for us and the power of what your mercy does is we just need to believe and trust and say, you know what? There is power in that blood. And I know, God, it's hard to think for some people, those that are skeptical, even the Adam and Eve story or Jesus. But God, the one thing that we can all agree on is that we all feel the weight of broken choices. And it's broken because our souls are broken. And the only way that we can be made right and made whole again is there's a God who pursues us, a God who wants to just heal us and fix us and change us and transform us in our sin. And he shows us mercy so that that we know how much he loves us. And I pray right now, God, that there are those watching, listening, hearing God, that are ready to put their hands up and say, I'm done trying to hide and conceal. I'm done with all the mess ups. I wanna be set free today from my sin because of Jesus. So God, this message is a message of hope and encouragement. God, this is a message that we can change, that things can be different, that we don't have to be defined by the past anymore, that there is power in the blood, that our story is one of freedom and hope, all because of Jesus. So God, if there's someone watching today, I pray that they would just kind of put their hand up and say, God, I'm a sinner. I need a savior who is Jesus to come into my life. I want to be set free and I want to begin to be transformed so I can be walking my life with him. God, those simple four sentences of a prayer can begin a journey of freedom, of cleansing, of wholeness and healing. And we just ask for this, God, in your name, the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. I am so glad that you were with us today because this message of this tree that God had that just kind of helped us understand where do the origins of our mess ups come from, but that God doesn't see us or define us by them. God wants to bring us into something better and fresher and one to help us, if I dare say this, to help us to thrive in our lives, but only if we let our roots grow deep so that when these moments come, we can live strong through the power of Jesus. We want to thank you for joining us today as a part of Thrive Online. Next week, if you want to be a part of things, remember we have a 15-minute party on site next week. There are other ways to connect with us. Would you fill out a connect card? We would love to be able to just reach out to you, encourage you in your faith journey. If you want someone to pray for you, you can talk to the online host. They'd be happy to do it. Or you can put a prayer request down and someone could reach out to you and contact you because we'd love to help you overcome the simple things in your life so that you can be set free in God. Connect card, 15-minute party. There are so many other ways that we want to help you, encourage you in your journey of finding and following Jesus. And especially if you said, I want to trust in Jesus today, would you put that down on the connect card? Because we would love to celebrate that best and biggest decision of your life with you today. Thank you for joining us today. We continue next week with another tree as a part of our Rooted series that we look at. And we just want to say thank you for being a part of watching today. And we'll see you next time at Thrive Online.